I offer you a joyful Resurrection Sunday uh, morning and welcome to the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church of Memphis Incorporated YouTube channel. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you will keep us, guide us, and use us in your service. Speak through your servant and give us a resurrected uh, living word for your glory and for our edification. In the wonderful name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Our text for today is found in the book of Mark, uh, chapter 16, verse 6. That's Mark, chapter 16, verse 6. It reads from the English Standard Version, And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. Now, this is a conversation between uh, Mary Magdalene and uh, other women that arrived at the tomb early uh, that morning, and they find that Jesus is not in the tomb. They went to anoint his body to finish up what uh, uh, some of the other disciples had started, and they find that he's not there. They are informed, they are, they are giving this wonderful, powerful message that he's not here uh, by an angel. So let's kind of unpack that and walk through it and see what we can get out of it. Uh, I don't have to, but because it's so true, I want to remind you of the wonderful job the Holy Spirit did through Lamona on Thursday night's Bible study in uh, letting us know why did Jesus have to die. And today, hopefully, the Holy Spirit will work through me in a, the same manner to show us why did Jesus have to rise. Now, this message brings us uh, glad tidings that he who once died for us now lives for us. And for the sake of convenience in the presentation of thought, allow me to speak of Christ's death uh, as having two aspects in it, saving effectiveness, a heavenward view and an earthward view. This reminds us of the importance of our constant view to avoid uh, being distracted from our constant participation in the Great Commission. Matthews chapter 28, verse 19 and 20 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things. Uh, and behold, uh, I am with you always, even unto the end of the ages. Now notice that this heavenly and earthly view is not saying that we should maintain a backward view except for the purpose of remembering where the Lord has brought us from and what he has done for us, especially on the cross on Calvary. Now Abraham was looking forward with compassion even when he went to rescue Lot from Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, uh, maybe you are worst, uh, Western fanatics like I am. I watch a lot of Westerns, Gunsmoke, uh, Rifleman, Wagon Train. Now, the other day, Chris Hale, who is the uh, wagon master on the Western uh, Wagon Train, he spoke a word to me as he explained to a young man of the importance of not holding the fact that his father had left him and his mother uh, when he was very young and only returned sometime after his mother was dead. Chris Hale said to the young man, don't allow love to turn to hate. Don't allow love to turn to hate. Now, notice how Abraham showed the love of God by not allowing love to turn to hate. 
even though they had him, Abraham and Lot had parted because of a dispute about their inability to dwell together in the same geographical location, they felt that uh, one would be getting more than the other. So Abraham decided to solve the problem by allowing Lot to choose what he considered the best land and Abraham choose, chose what was left uh, would can be, could be construed as the lesser productive land. Now, here's where it gets interesting and we can learn a godly lesson. When Lot needed help from the one he had wronged, Abraham didn't play the remember what you did to me card, but instead he showed a love for Lot that had not turned to hate, but an enduring love for the one who had wronged him. Far too often we allow what we perceive others to have done to us to turn our love for them into hate. And when we notice our own shortcomings, instead of dwelling on our lack of Christ's love within us, we say things to turn the focus on others and away from ourselves when, when we at the minimum have as much problem loving others the way we want them to love us. I'd go so far as to say that only, uh, the only one that has not allowed this to happen is the Trinity towards us. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit has, a, has not allowed their love for us to turn to hate. And uh, Brother Sanders about here, if we were still uh, meeting together in the building, would help me out by stating that all means all of us. All of us have come short of God's glory. And even though Jesus displayed the great love, uh, the greatest love ever by dying for those that rejected him, uh, just like he died for those who accepted him, the same love. Uh, John chapter 15, verse 12 and 13 says, this is my commandment that, I, that you love one another as I have loved you. And greater love has no one than this, that someone lays down his life for his friend. Had Jesus not risen, that abiding love would not be with all that came after that dying love. Romans chapter four, verse 23 through 25 says, but the, wor but, but the words from Abraham's life that said it was counted to him were not written for Abraham's sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus Christ our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Justification in the Greek form uh, comes from a word mean uh, dikeio, the dikeo, which is a legal term equivalent to acquittal and opposed to condemnation. In an apologetic sense, it is often synonymous with vindication or freeing from unjust imputations of blame. Now, God doesn't have to apologize because all are guilty and come short of his moral righteousness. God's act of justification does vindicate us and frees us from what we deserve, and that's called mercy. Romans chapter 5, verse 7 through 11 says, uh, For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good one, one would dare to die. Verse 8 says, But God, and we remember that when we hear in the Bible the words, 
but God, God is about to change something in that for us, to change something in our lives, to change what has happened to what he desires for us. So uh, it, when we look at verse seven, it says, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Looking forward. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall be saved by his life. And more than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17 through 22 says, and if Christ has not been raised, our faith or your faith is futile, is no good, worth nothing. And you are still in your sins. It's important that he rose. And verse 18 says, then those also who have fallen asleep or died in Christ have perished if he didn't rise. And if Christ, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of, mo of all people most to be pitied. The King James ver Version says, it, uh, Paul uh, says, if in this life only I have reason to hope in Christ, I am among men most miserable. Verse 20 goes on to say, the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all died, so also in Christ all uh, shall all be made alive. Now, if we expect to live joyful, peaceful, and fruitful lives, we must work out our salvation by learning and practicing loving one another the same way Jesus loved us and is loving us. Let's continue with the heavenward and earthward view. Emphasis is on its power in both directions depending on the truth that he is risen. Now, the, 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 the heavenward aspect, uh, we benefit in this direction from the death of Christ, depending on our trust in him and not in our abilities to explain precisely what his death or resurrection has done. It's important that we put our trust in him. We know at any rate that it has, it has done all that was necessary. His death and his resurrection has done all that was necessary and that not only has he died, but also risen again. Now the earthward aspect uh, uh, teaches us that he who is our savior must be uh, our Savior every day, and our Savior in every place, and our Savior from Satan and from the world, and from ourselves. We need saving from ourselves. Well, let me speak for myself. I need saving from myself because I fall into the category of who's uh, Every thought is evil without Jesus Christ. So I need saving from myself and there's nothing that I can do to save myself. 
but I need a savior, not one that just died on cross to save me from my sins, but one to walk with me daily, to live in me and save me from myself. I need that resurrection power all the time. And not only must we, uh, by the heavenward effectiveness of his death, have the forgiveness of sin, but by its earthwards effectiveness, we must have him with us as a, as a living presence ever at work by the renewing of the Holy Spirit. A dead Jesus will not take uh, a hand against a dictatorship that uh, was attempted by Donald Trump. A dead Jesus will not give us a new song to sing. I've been washed by the blood of the Lamb. A dead Jesus will not be very present help with us in trouble, like he was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, like he was Daniel in the lion's den. A dead Jesus will not work for the emancipation or freeing of slaves from the power and presence of sin. A dead savior will not save us from legal complication. He won't be a lawyer in a court courtroom if he's dead. A dead doctor will not save us from the grasp of a fever or a deadly disease because he couldn't be a doctor in a sick room. Just as fantastic and just as insane is the conception of salvation by faith in a dead savior. We need a live savior for our faith to be real, for our salvation to be real for our very future to be real. Without the resurrection, all of the gospel would collapse as an ark would collapse without a cornerstone. Jesus is our chief cornerstone. A cornerstone is like a solid foundation. His resurrection is a solid foundation for our lives. Now, the grave is the only place where the true seekers of Jesus may not find him. I'll say that again. The grave is the only place where the true seekers of Jesus may not find him. He's not here, says the angel. This will not apply in heaven. He's not here. That will not uh, uh, some 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 uh, guys you'll hear from the old school uh, of another race. You'll hear them say, uh, "That dog won't hunt." In other words, uh, he's not here. Will not apply to heaven because he is at the right hand of the Father, making intercessions for us. He's in heaven, preparing a place for a prepared people. He's not here. This will not apply to any earthly solitude. He's giving us peace that the world can't give and the world can't take from us. He's not here. This will not apply to the walk of human lives. I, uh, there's a song, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. And the voice I hear falling on my ears, the Son of God discloses, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me that I am his own. And the joy, unspeakable joy, that we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known, and none other can provide us. He's not here. This will not apply to the worshiping assembly where he has promised that where two or three are gathered together in my name, touching and agreeing, there will I be in the midst. 
he's not here. Christ is not in the grave. To think of Christ as among the dead would be to give up faith in Christ Jesus. Christ is alive. He cannot therefore be among the dead. He must therefore be everywhere except in the grave. All who know the glad tidings are bound to tell them to others. Just like John did on the Isle of Patmos when he heard Jesus saying, uh, go and tell them this in Revelations 1 and 17. He says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me saying unto me, fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. He did die one Friday on an old rugged cross on a hill called Calvary. But early the third day morning, he rose with all power in his hand. And there's a song that I'm going to close with that goes something like this. He sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life now is worth living just because he lives. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for keeping us, leading us, and using us. And I pray that you will give the increase that all with ears may hear and become doers of your word. That we'll tell somebody that is sinking in sin, somebody that has lost all hope, that yes, Jesus yet lives, and he will live forevermore. And because he lives, he's able to change a dark future into a bright and shining day. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' wonderful name, I pray. Amen. Remember to mask up, practice social distancing, continue to wash your hands often, and don't do it just for you, but do it for others also. We lose nothing by being others-minded. I pray that God will bless you through this resurrection uh, Sunday morning message and that you will become a blessing to someone else. And with that, as usual, I'm out of here. Bye-bye. I love you.